In his book, Six Hours, One Friday, Max Lucada tells a story of how he survived a hurricane. Uh, an old man gave him an advice to take his boat to the deep water and throw the anchors of uh, uh, four corners of the board and pray that anchors will hold. So this is what he did and he survived the hurricane. And this is what he says, uh, what he learned from his experience being in the deep sea during the storm, during the hurricane. And he says that important lesson he learned for himself. All of us need an anchor during the storms of life. We need something stable to hold us in places. And... Uh, one of the biggest anchors in your spiritual life is faith in Jesus Christ. This is what could hold you in place when the hurricanes hit you, when a storm is raging. This is something what could keep you alive. Good morning and welcome to a special Sabbath. We call it the profession of faith Sabbath. We know what the definition is for the profession of faith. It's a public declaration of your faith and your willingness to follow Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. Paul, if you remember his epistle to Romans in chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, this is what he says. If you confess and declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Wonderful. And verse 10 says, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. But then, he says, it is with your mouth that you profess that your faith, that you are finally saved. You believe with your heart, and this is credited to your righteousness, and the profession of your mouth credits to you being saved. It is rightly so. The public declaration of faith is very important in your life. Remember the words of Jesus in the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 33. You keep your finger in the Bible on that place. This is going to be one of our central verses for this morning. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, and verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. But Jesus also said that words are not enough. Your confession does not really come from your words. Gospel of Mark, chapter 7, verse 6. Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And here we understand that profession of faith is not a declaration only. It's not just the things you're going to say and uh, they're going to change your life. And we also remember the story when uh, Jesus uh, just gave us a picture of what will be happening at the end of times when God personally will be testing your faith and your profession of faith. And that story is written down in the book of Matthew chapter 7 verses 21, 22, and 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And then the verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evil doers. So we know that at the end of times, God will test my profession of faith. And he will be a judge whether my faith was real or not. St. Augustine once said that, forgot to say I never knew you. It's only another way of saying you never knew me. You never had me in your heart. This morning, I want you to ask yourself hard questions. Does my faith go further than verbal commitment, acknowledgement, and declarations? What if I am not only fooling myself uh, into thinking that I have faith? 
what is my profession of faith? And what does it mean to confess Jesus Christ before men? The title of my sermon for today is, I have decided, I have decided to follow Jesus. And I'm going to begin uh, with a v very well-known verse uh, in the Bible. It's found in the book of James chapter 2 verse 19. You believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. Apostle James warns us that simply professing your faith and believe in God who is in heaven does not make much difference between you and demons. If you profess that you believe in Jesus Christ, good. But so what? The demons believe in him. The demons profess their faith in him, in God. Demons are not atheists. They do not deny God. They are not stupid. They are not foolish. They know that God exists. The foolish man de uh, denied God, uh, as, uh, as David says in the book of Psalm. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. But demons are not fools. They, they are not stupid. They do not deny the very existence of God. And Bible says that when they hear the word of God, the name of God, they shout in fear. Just mention the name of God uh, gets them in a fear mood. And the word shudder uh, is uh, the word freezer, which means to bristle with fear, which means to shudder with fear, uh, to be struck with extreme fear, to be horrified. And to be horrified to the point when your hair stands up. Uh, Riza, uh, if, you, if you ask me, uh, this is a very serious confession, right? You fear so much that you tremble with it, with fear. Uh, there is a Hebrew counterpart of the word uh, shada which is found in the book of Job, chapter 4, verses 14 and 15. And this is what Job says, Fear and trembling seize me, and may all my bows shake or shudder. The spirit glided past my face, and the air on my body stood on end. And Job says, I'm, I'm trembling. I'm, I'm shaking with fear because God is right here. And I'm in his presence. So when demons are saying that they are shattered because of God is right there. Because they understand that God is right there. He is alive. It's a serious confession. It's a serious profession of, of belief in him. They do not doubt. They do not deny. And honestly, <laughs> we don't see that kind of faith in people today. People don't fear God anymore. They live in oblivion to God's existence. Look around. The people don't really count God as someone who is in reality, in existence, right? We kind of said God does not exist anymore. We throw him out of uh, all parts of our lives. So if you, if you ask me, the, the, the faith and profession of demons is much higher than the profession of, uh, of people in the world. But that's not the kind of uh, faith and profession Jesus is looking for. This morning I want to just briefly speak with you on what the profession of faith is in reality. And I want you to listen to this. Check it with the Bible and check it with your life. Will it fit your profession? Is it something what you believe? Is it something what is happening in your life? So the first, the confession and profession of faith. What it really means. Let's go uh, back to our main verse for today. is found in the book of Matthew 10, 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, 
him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. And of course, if you know me, we will look at the words because this is one of the best ways how to uh, dig deeper into the word of God and to understand it. So the Greek word for confession, to confess or profess the name of the Lord is homologeo. It, uh, it composed with uh, two words. The first one is homo, which means the same, which means together or at the same place or at the same time. Meaning together we are united in the same place, on the same mind, uh, in the same time. And the second word is lago, which means to speak, to tell, to say, uh, speak as a conclusion, to come to conclusion together. So this is the uh, meaning of the word confess in, in Greek. So it means to say uh, the same thing, to say, uh, uh, to agree with, with another, to come to the same conclusion, uh, to confess or to profess or to be in a full agreement, to align with, or to be of one mind. Uh, that, of, co of course, begs the question. To come to the same conclusion, to be of the same mind, with whom? Who needs to be with the same mind on the same page? The answer is, in agreement with God himself. My confession, meaning and profession, that I am in agreement with God. I am on the same page with God. My confession is I am with the same mind as God is. Let's take at one example in the Bible. This is a famous place, first book of John, chapter 1, verse 19. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and he'll forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we confess, first of all, that's an admission. It means that uh, I need to admit that I'm guilty before God. Is it true? Yes. But that's not the whole picture. To come to the same conclusion about sin as God does. Do you really take sin that serious as God takes it? Admission of your guilt may not always be the same degree of understanding of what is happening in your life. And what sin is, right? But God says that you will be with me with the same mind and you will have uh, the same understanding as I have about sin. We see things as God sees them. It is to understand and know the character of God because sin is what? It is a transgression of the law. So we need to understand what law is. And law is what? Is the character of God. Isn't it true? So this is how we arrive to the uh, one-mindedness with God. In a simple occasion of confessing my sin, it means that I need to be with the same mind as God on so many issues in my life. On, a, my, on my character, on the character of God, on what is happening in the world. It's a confession. The first definition of it. Is to be of the same mind with God. To be in a full agreement with God. To come to the same conclusions as God does. Can you say that about yourself? Are you on the same page with God? On so many issues in the world or in your life. Are you in agreement with God about everything? Look deeply into your life. Are you in agreement with God on everything? And that's what demons cannot do. They know God exists. They believe God exists. They, they're not stupid. They're not fools. They do not deny the, uh, the existence of God. They know He is right there. And they know it 
on a personal level, so close, so personal, that they tremble at the very mention of the name of God. But this is where they not in accordance with him. They are not of the same mind with him. They don't agree with him. They know he exists. They believe in him. They even profess to the whole world, the universe, that yes, there is God. And they're even afraid of him. Their feet, they have the genuine fear of God. But they do not agree with God on anything. They have belief, they have profession, but they are not in agreement with God. You heard it so many times, people say, I have my own opinion on that. How many times you have said that? Hundreds of times. I have my own opinion on this, on that. And we are so proud of this, right, when we say that. <laughs> it seems like we, we, we think that this is something what uh, kind of makes me big in my own eyes when I have my own opinion on this, on that. And our society promotes it because, after all, we live in a, in a world and a society which kind of a values and put it on top the individuality of everybody, right? You need to be different. You need to be individual. You need to have your own opinion, right? <laughs> we heard it so many times from kindergarten all the way up to the universities. Well... But here is the thing. If your individual opinion is not the same as God's, if you do not come to the same conclusions as God, probably you cannot profess the name of the Lord. It means then you are not on the same page with him. And your confession and your profession is not valid, is fraud, is faulty. If your individual opinion is different from the opinion of God, then the Bible says clearly you cannot profess the name of the Lord. You professing something else. But not him. Be of the same mind with God. Be with, in full agreement with God. It means to come to the same conclusions as God does. Check yourself on that. Where do you stand? Are you in agreement with God on everything? Or you have your own opinions? Uh, let's look at another dimension of the word confession or profession. Let's go to the time when God will test the profession of people and my faith at the very end of times when Jesus will come and the line of people will be right there and God will tell them these words. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God, of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Uh, and you will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, did not we prophesy uh, in your name and in your name uh, drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles. And this is what Jesus will say to them then i will tell them plainly i never knew you away from me evil doers so jesus says who these people are well i know them yes i have created them but then he says i never knew you so, God says, not everyone who professes my name does it in a genuine way. The last verse gives us a clue what Jesus is looking in my profession, in my confession. 
And these last words are uh, in Ram. I never knew you. And it gives us another dimension on what, what it means to know God, what it means to confess Him. Uh, to uncover that, let's go to the Old Testament. Old Testament helps us a lot just to connect all the ideas together and then it comes to uh, together in one beautiful picture. So we go to the book of Psalm, chapter 32, verse 5. Book of Psalm, chapter 32, verse 5. And we're going to stay here for, uh, uh, for a few minutes. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover my iniquities. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin uh, you find something brilliant in this verse this verse has two words which describe what real confession is and the first one is to acknowledge this is the same greek word which means to profess or confess so let's take a look at the first one what it means and this is what it means acknowledge this is the hebrew word yada and you know what it means, right? If you uh, frequently uh, study your Bible, you know what this word in Hebrew means. Yada means to know. To know someone in an intimate way. To be so close to someone as husband and wife. The closest ever union you can ever imagine is husband and wife. And this is why God chose this image to, to tell us something about his relationship to us. In a certain way, how you relate to each other in marriage, this is how I relate to you. So confession in the Old Testament uh, is described with the word yadat, to know, in a very intimate way. I just will give you one example from the book of Genesis chapter 4 verse 1. And Adam knew his wife. Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. It, what it means in real? It means to be in relationship with someone. It, it means to know someone so close as husband and wife. <laughs> now when we go back to Jesus and the judgment, and in the judgment Jesus says, I never knew you. And we already know what it means. It means that you never knew me. There is uh, something what we call relationship knowledge. It's, you see, uh, I know all of you. But not with all of you, I have a relationship. Right? Relationship knowledge is, is something deeper. It goes much deeper. You spend more time, you know that person closely in a very different manner as we know each other publicly. Relationship knowledge is something what could exist between uh, two close friends or husband and wife when we know each other so deeply. Uh, and this is what kind of a relationship God says when you confess me. You have relationship knowledge with me. You know me so close. So just check this list of recommendations. And by the way, it's taken from Healthy Relationship and Marriage Education Seminar or Training. So you look, it's simple things. You look at them and you check your existing relationship. And this is how you grow it. When you grow the, uh, that relationship knowledge of each other. And this is the real practical ways. This is how you do. Uh, number one, let's read it. Um, this is what it says. Ask about your, your partner. His or her thoughts, feelings. Do you really know what's going on inside of the heart? Inside of the heart? Do you know the feelings of your uh, husband or your, your wife? you know the thoughts of the husband and wife? Do you understand the thought process of how she arrived to that conclusion? You would be surprised how many couples don't talk to each other. Lack of communication. And you know what happened next? When you stop 
inquiring, when you stop talking to each other, what happened? Nothing happens. Your relationship does not grow. And it goes for the destination which is called divorce. Now, flip it to your relationship with God and ask yourself a very hard question. Do you really know what God, God's thoughts and feelings are? Just imagine yourself in these relationships. Do you really know God, God's thoughts, God's feelings? What He thinks and how He thinks and why He thinks that way? Do you really know what's on the mind of God? And how do we know that? How do we inquire what's on the mind of God? We have two big avenues. Number one is read His Word. This is where you will find what on the mind of God. Do you ask God with the scripture in hands what's on His mind? Do you know His feelings? And the second big avenue, how you inquire what is happening in the head uh, of God, is your prayer. Your time, which you spend with Him in conversation. And prayer is not just asking me, 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 and give me, give me, give me. Prayer is a conversation in which you get to know Him more closely. Check yourself. Do you really know God? Do you talk to Him? How often do you talk to him? Do you know his thought process? Do you know what he feels about this issue, about that issue? Do you really know it? And do you really want to know what he knows? Do you communicate with God on a regular basis? Do you read his word? Do you talk to him or your relationship with God? is heading to the big destination which is called divorce. When you don't know him anymore. So this is the first one. Check it. Check your relationship with the Lord. Do you know him? Do you take steps to know him? Second, being sensitive to your partner's warriors and needs. Uh, Guys, you know it, right? If you don't put uh, the uh, needs of your wife as a priority in your life, you're not going to go anywhere, right? It's, it's a dead end. Uh, and wives, if you do not put the priorities uh, and needs of your husband somewhere up high, you're not going anywhere. In relationship, this is when two people are putting the priorities and needs, needs of others on a very high priorities. Selfish relationship do not last. Now think about you and God. How selfish you are in your relationship with God. Analyze your prayers, your talk with the Lord. What is the biggest amount there in your conversations? It's me, 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 me. Bless me, give me, protect me. I need this, I need that. I need your guidance. I need you to be with me over here, over there. It's always about me, 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 right? Always. At least the majority of prayers. But God gives us something bigger and more beautiful. He says, I am in a real relationship with you. I'm not in genie in a bottle. I want to give you more than that. I want to give you more than just answering your prayers. And your desires. I'm giving you a satisfaction of being fully present in your life. And that's beautiful. That's much more bigger than we ever can ask of God. Are you in a selfish relationship with God? Third, uh, recalling the positive experience together. That's a beautiful thing, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's how you get closer to each other when you remember what was in the past and how it was nice and how it was beautiful uh, with, with your loved one. Do you have an awesome experience with God? 
Look at your life, at your spiritual life. Remember, do you have that something outstanding, beautiful, and awesome with the Lord? Have you experienced the Lord in your life? And how beautiful He was right there. Think about your life. Think about your experience with God. Number four, uh, expressing sincere interest. Uh, most likely you've seen couples who are not interested in each other anymore. Unfortunately, I've seen many of them. Unhappy people will end up parting the ways. People not interested in each other will be in the different corners. How about you and God? Do you have that genuine interest in Him? And not in what He gives you, but in Him. It's, that's a test of love, right? In, in, in any relationship, if you're interested in a person and not what that person brings into your life and how that person makes you happy because you're getting something from a person. This is why Bible calls love is sacrificial because you want to give, not take. How interested you are in your relationship with God. Fifth, seeing things through uh, your uh, husband and wife eyes. This is when you put her vision, her understanding, her needs ahead of yours. So you would think, how would she react to that? Will she like it? Or this is what I like. Will she like it? Well, this is what God is constantly teaching us. Be of the same mind with me. And you will see what I like. And I will show you what is the best thing in the world. And you will like it too. And the last one. Discuss how you see this relationship together. Talk and discuss. And this is what God is always doing with us. He spends so much time in talking to us, in discussions. And he comes to us and he says, um, come, let us reason together. Come, let us sit down at the table and we're going to reason together. We will have a discussion and I will give you my points. And I will listen to you. God loves discussions. He never shrinks from an opportunity to talk to, to a person. So that was a uh, confession on the level of to know God. Do you grow your uh, relationship knowledge with God? Now let's look at another dimension of the word confession. Book of Psalm chapter 32 verse 5. And we're going to look at the other word which, uh, um, which is here and describes the confessions. The confession, uh, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. But it's a little different word. Let's see what it means. And it means confess and it spells almost the same. Just one letter difference. But it does have a different meaning behind it. So this is what it means. Give thanks and a loud praise. Worship God. Literally it means uh, yeah, from the word uh, your hands. So you, you uh, stretch out your hands as in worship. So God says, when you worship to me, you will be confessing my name. And you know what worship means to a person who reads the Bible in the Old Testament? Simple. You can only worship when you bring your sins to the Lord and you take from him his atonement. This is the whole worship. The worship is when you come to the temple, you bring the sacrifice, and you ask to forgive your sins. This is what real worship is. Confession, Bible says, is when you come to me, you worship, you give thanks, and you receive the forgiveness from me. You receive what Jesus Christ has done for you on the cross. This is when you confess 
me when you accept what I have done for you on a cross. Beautiful. This is our third definition of confession. To come to him with praise and worship, accepting what he has done for me. Otherwise, if you come to the worship and you raise your hands, but you do not confess and you do not accept what he has done for you, your worship is fraud, in vain. It doesn't do anything for you. If you sit in church, but you do not accept the atonement, you do not, you do not accept him and his sacrificial uh, uh, power, then it's all for nothing. Then it's your profession will be judged by Jesus. And he says, I never knew you. The last one, I'm not going to torture you for longer. The last thing what I want to mention this morning. Another dimension of the word profession or confession. Again, we're going to go back to our main verse, book of Psalm, chapter 32, verse 5. And it says this, Then I acknowledge my sin to you, and did not cover my iniquities. I said I, will, I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And the word he used, I said, and, uh, and the word said is uh, determine. I have decided to confess. I have decided, determine, made a decision to be with God. It's always involving, decision is always involving your brain, your whole being. You know, the brain is a mastermind of everything of your life. This is where your decision and destination is being born. I have decided. So confession at the bottom line is your decision to follow God. Well, The big debate raging across America, pie versus cake. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you are cake people? All right. How many of you are pie people? Raise your hands. All right. Okay. Now, uh, how many of you uh, can go both ways undecided? Undecided. All right. It's always good to help people in church who are undecided, huh? <laughs> All right. All right. Well, uh, I have to admit, pies and cakes, both of them taste good, right? It's wonderful. I love them both. And on different occasions, I can uh, side with a third group. I can go for cake. I can go for pie. It depends on my mood or whatever. So I love both of them. But let me give you just... Uh, uh, some, you know, uh, cons and pros of, of bows. First, uh, cake looks great. If you want to go for looks, that's cake, right? Always cake. But pies smells good. If you want to go for smells, that's pie. Cake don't smell usually, right? It may smell but when it smells, it's already not good. But pie smells very good. Second, cake is all about the decoration. It's all about the outside. If you want a presentation, go with cake. Pie, on the other hand, it's all about what's inside. It's always something hidden inside. Third reason to choose between cake and pie is... Uh, Cake says, go celebrate. If it's a birthday, a uh, wedding, or whatever, you go with a cake. It's a celebration. Happy birthday cake. I never heard about happy birthday pie. It's kind of doesn't sit well in my head. Maybe, maybe somebody should invent a happy birthday pie. It would be nice. But so far, we have birthdays, celebrations, and that will be cake. But pies says, welcome home. We have missed you. It's so personal. It's so homey. It's so close, right? Yeah, welcome home. Oh, welcome to the neighborhood. We don't bring cakes to the neighbors, right? We bring pies. Welcome. It's more kind of a homey style. You can save 
uh, the cake for later, right? If you haven't finished the cake, you can cut it in pieces and eat it later. But I have never heard about the leftovers of pies. It's always finished to the last drop, right? Okay, now, uh, you heard all the uh, cons and, and pros for cakes and pies, but you don't have to choose between them. As people say, as long as we have a cheesecake, uh, that's your middle ground. You can, uh, you can have a cheesecake at any time, and it's going to be half cake, half pie. The point is this. There are choices and there are decisions to make in life. Which dessert to have? Cake or pie? This is your choice, not a decision. You can have a cake today and you can have a pie tomorrow. Or you can have them both at the same time on the table. Choice, but not a decision. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, we use choose and decide interchangeably sometimes. Uh, uh, but really, these two words have different meanings. So let, let's look at the first word, choice. Uh, uh, the, the word choice uh, means uh, to select, as you select an item, to pick, to, uh, uh, to pick out. Uh, this is the way you choose or select the item in a grocery store. You go and you choose what you want today or what you like today. So, at the bottom line, choice is temporary. Because you can go tomorrow for something different. So today uh, I'm choosing this, but tomorrow I can choose something else. And we often do that. So in pie versus cake controversy, eh, who cares? Today is a pie, tomorrow is a cake, and everybody's happy. So my choice is temporary, which suits me today, which appeals to my eyes today may not be the same thing tomorrow. But when we come to the word decision, decision is a completely different idea behind the word. Uh, and it comes from the word decider, decider which, mean, which, which is a combination of two words. The first one is de, de, and it means off of something. And uh, sider means cut. So the idea behind the word desire it's something when you sever, when you cut. Your decision is permanent, unless it's supposed to be permanent. When you say, uh, I want to quit smoking, uh, you don't say, I choose not to smoke today, because uh, smoking is not uh, an option to you anymore. You need to decide to quit smoking. If you choose not to smoke today, it means that in an hour or two, I may choose to smoke. Decision is something what's supposed to be permanent. You cut it, you sever it, and it does not go together anymore. Confession. It's a decision. It's not only merely a choice, it's a solid decision. It is something permanent. To determine, to make a decision to follow Jesus. One of my favorite hymns, I have decided to follow Jesus. I love this, it's so simple. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. For none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. Have you decided to follow Jesus? Is it your decision? Are you undecided? 
Or are we just choosing Jesus today, but tomorrow I might go with something else? Or I choose the items which I like in Christianity or in the Bible. The rest I just put them aside because I don't really feel like I, I, I want to choose it today. Have you decided to be with him? Are you of the same mind with him? Whosoever therefore shall confess me before man, him will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. And this is the real confession. Just to remind you, four points which we have discussed this morning. The first one, be of the same mind with God. To be in full agreement with God. To come to the same conclusions as God does. On every issue in the world, on every issue in your life, are you on the same page with God? To know God on an intimate level and to have that relationship knowledge with God. God is not about form. God is not about rituals. He care less about that, but he is all for relationship with you. Do you know him? And that's the main question which will be asked of you on the last judgment. Do you know him? The rest of it doesn't matter. He's not going to ask you how good was the service on Sabbath, uh, how many Sabbaths you missed. Uh, he doesn't. Uh, he will not ask you all these things which we pay attention to in church. It will all disappear, but he will ask you the biggest one. Do you know me? The third one, confession is to come to him in praise and worship. And the real worship is accepting him. Accepting his sacrifice. If the sacrifice is not happening during the service, then that service is also in vain. We are not here to entertain. And the whole purpose of today's uh, beautiful concert was not to entertain you. There was not for a reason to, to have a good and nice service in church. And it was so. It was very good today. Thank you, everyone who participated this morning. That was awesome. But the whole purpose and every song and every music was to give Him glory. We have been lifting our hands high and saying, God, we praise you, we worship you, and we accept your sacrifice personally. And the last one, confession is to determine, to make a decision to follow Jesus. Today's profession of faith, Saban, is a decision which we all make. And it's your lifelong decision to be Christ followers.